Learned I had a natural aptitude for electronics, decided not to be an aeronautical engineer, I'd get out and be an electronics engineer. And uh, that's what I started to do when I went to Caltech. But I got pulled out for the Korean War. When I got out of the, um, got sent home from the war, spent my time, I was pulled out in a mid-year from Caltech. And under the GI Bill, you could not repeat any time. So I would have had to pay for that, repeat that year on my own, and I didn't have any money. So I couldn't go back to Caltech. So I went to the richest man I knew and said, what should I do with my life? And he said, uh, become an accountant. Everything's going to be numbers from now on. And so I went to Woodbury College and two years, got an accounting degree and got hired by Pricewaterhouse. We came to Newport Beach to redo the business system for Hope Hospital. And uh, because the, um, the business- Hope fairly just opened by the, at that point? Uh, they had been open for a while, but they were all little one-story buildings with red tile roofs, and we were just building the first building with uh, I don't know, four or five story building with round corners. Their business manager had stolen all the money and left town. And that's why they hired us to find out how he got it, how much money he got. The board came to me one day and said, uh, we've been looking for a controller to run this thing now, and we can't find one we like. But you built it, why don't you run it? So I said, well, what's the pay? And it was three times what Price Waterhouse was paying me. And I said, well, you got a deal. And, and um, so I became controller, first controller of Hogue Hospital. And moved to Newport Beach. Yeah. The early 70s, you wanted to build 48 units, apartments? Uh, condos. Condos in Corona Del Mar. Yeah. And I got uh, the approval. They were worth a lot of money today. Oh, God, yes. <laughs> they were worth a lot of money then. And uh, I got the approval of all the, the city council except the mayor, Mayor Stoddard. And he said, Bill, I, I just, it's a gorgeous project. I just don't think it's right for that area to, to go out over the water like that. But I think you're going to get it, and I'll commit right now to the one, the highest one out, the farthest out, the top unit. I commit to buy that right now, whatever the, whatever the cost. And uh, but he says I don't think you should build it, but if you do, I want to be in it. So that was kind of interesting. In other words, I'll cast a vote against it. You have enough on the council to yeah. get it, yeah. but you didn't have that lawyer. to management, I said, we're never make a profit with the interest rate on our loan. I made the biggest loan that Teachers uh, Union had ever made at the time. And uh, I said, with the interest on the loan and, and the, what we can get for, for fees from the TV customers and expenses and so forth, I projected out 10 years, we'll, we'll never turn a profit. So the company says, fine, we'll sell the company. We'll get half of our losses back in cash from the government on, on tax loss. So I worked myself right out of a job. And then I went into, um, borrowed um, $10,000 on my house and bought a fiveplex in uh, Costa Mesa, rundown, remodeled it, refinanced it, borrowed a little more money up to 49000 bought eight more units, uh, remodeled those, and I just kept doing that till I got to 50 units in Costa Mesa. Then got talked into, they said we shouldn't keep all your eggs in one basket. So I sold half of them and took my money to Texas and lost it all down there. Lost a million dollars cash in Texas. Investing in oil at the wrong time? Uh, no, investing in apartment houses. Vacant, at apartment, the wrong time. vacant apartment houses. After all these successful business ventures, or some not, uh, for extraneous reasons, yeah. you're at Square What? You're yeah. in I've been, uh, and you're not even in Newport Beach? I've been wealthy three or four times. <laughs> There's an old saying, uh, Jimmy the Greek, he said, the late Jimmy the Greek said, Bernard Baruch told him, he said, every person, every well, gambler, he said, goes rich, 
goes uh, boom and bust seven times. It's the seventh one you gotta watch out for. <laughs> yeah. Big, heavy set guy walked into our office with a roll of plans under his arm and his name was Helmut Koch, and he was a German engineer, and he had a set of hydrofoil plans, the Germans' hydrofoil boat, and they had scuttled all those hydrofoil boats at, near the end of the war, so there weren't any. And he, he had, had captured these plans, and he said, what you need for, a hy for Catalina is a hydrofoil boat to get there in 30 minutes instead of uh, two hours. We built it, and we built it right in Costa Mesa in the old uh, bowling alley. Um, and uh, it worked, flew great, got it certified to carry passengers for hire, which is the first hydrofoil in America ever to be certified to carry passengers for hire. And we ran it to Catalina, but we had troubles because we could go over there all right, but the foils were fixed, and coming home with a following sea, that following sea would raise the aft of the boat and then it would just plow right into the water. So to get back, we would have to tack clear to San Pedro and then come down the trough of the waves to, to Newport Beach. It's a little bit of a longer Well, trip. yeah, there was an hour then, and so, in fact. So we, we gave up, we ran, then we ran it from Catalina to the Isthmus for a while. Wrigley didn't like that because we were competing with his slow boat that carried passengers up there, so he ran us off. So we sold the patent rights for a million dollars to an outfit in the East. We sent a guy down there to raise the boat, put it in dry dock, find that it was sound, and then we began working on it. And it took several months. I spent four months down there myself after it had been raised and and found seaworthy. And uh, it was a, a real challenge. We did the whole thing on no money. We borrowed the $25,000 from the bank. They're coming into San Diego and I called up and I said, uh, you, you've got to get here. I've got TV crews, everybody's waiting for you. You're supposed to be here. And they said, well, we're running out of fuel again. We're mixing lubricating oil into the fuel to stretch it. And uh, I said, well, call for that second engine. This is the emergency we invented. Turn on that second engine, get some more speed. And the guy says, well, I've been calling for it, and I can't get the engineer to, to start the second engine. Then I called and I said, oh, by the way, I told you guys you could be, bring in five-fifths of booze from Barbados. I, the customs man told me that that doesn't apply to a private yacht, and that's what we are you cannot bring that booze in that you were planning. Well, when they got in there, I asked George, the engineer, why he didn't turn on the engine. He said, well, when you couldn't, told me I couldn't bring in the booze, I stuck my five bottles in the manifold of that second engine. And I was not going to start, uh, start it up and, and blow up my, my rum, Barbadian rum. So anyway, it was a comedy of errors, but we got it home, and it's now a floating museum in Oakland, California. When she passed on, somebody said uh, they had known me way back when I knew, I didn't even mention Bobby before, but when I was on the, going to Woodbury College, I was living at home on the ranch in Pacoima. And that's where I first ran into Bobby, who's my present wife. And uh, I took her to her junior and senior prom, because she didn't know my boy. She rode horses every afternoon after school. She went to a Catholic girls' school, and their mom would pick her up and take her to the ranch to ride horses all afternoon. And then the way to, to uh, horse shows every weekend. And, uh, her prom time came and she asked me to take her to prom. I said, why me? She said, well, I don't, don't know any boys. I ran into a woman at a horse sale up in uh, Jimmy Stewart's old ranch. 
And she says, gee, sorry, your wife has died. Have you looked up Bobby? And I said, I have no idea where she is. And she said, well, I do. So she put us back together with love at first sight. And we've been married 34 years now. He said, well, gee, why don't you move down here permanently, hang your real estate shingle, um, on my office here on 121 Agate Avenue, and uh, I've got a vacant apartment in the building. Hang your shingle, move in. It's good and, to have uh, friends, friends yeah. to the place on yeah. Belleville Island. Yeah, so uh, we'd already been in love with the place. We've been down here so much. You remembered that week. And uh, yeah, so uh, we did that, and I've been here ever since. That's 25 years ago. It's a nice two and a half walk, Mile, two and a half mile walk around both islands. We did that a lot. We stopped, originally Starbucks was not here, it was Pandemon. And we used to stop and have coffee and maybe a cinnamon roll at the cinnamon roll fair. And uh, then continue the walk as we do now at, for stopping at Starbucks. But it was great exercise. Um, the people are friendly smiley and you get to know everybody you see the same people every day and that's the two and a half miles of boardwalk smiles if you can take a little bit of a break yeah but i have to keep working i have to like i said i've lost my fortune several times and uh, 